Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, firstly, welcome everyone to the webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today and taking the time to be here. Um, we're really excited to have you here. My name is Kayla Ripple, and I'm a principal associate with the Lenfest Ocean Program. Uh, so for those of you that may not be as familiar with us, the Lenfest Ocean Program is a grant-making program, and we fund ocean and coastal research projects to help address the needs that are facing decision makers and stakeholders. You can learn more about us and the projects we fund at lenfestocean.org, and while you're there, you can also sign up for our newsletter. Um, if you're on Twitter, be sure to follow us at Lenfest Ocean. In fact, my colleague Victoria Bell will be live tweeting from this account using the hashtag LOP webinar. So if you're on there, feel free to use that hashtag too if you'd like to engage with us there. Uh, for today's webinar, we're very excited to have Jason Link with NOAA Fisheries, Fiona Edwards, Lauren Brewster, and Steve Kadrin, all with the University of Massachusetts joining us today. Uh, they'll be sharing some preliminary results from their project, How Can Portfolio Theory Facilitate Ecosystem-Based Fisheries Management? And my colleague Emily Knight will drop a link to their project page in the chat section soon if you'd like to visit that and learn a little bit more. Um, I'll let the research team get into the details, but for us at Lenfest, this project is part of a broader portfolio of projects around operationalizing EBFM. And this is being led by the Lenfest Senior Program Officer, Jason Landrum. Emily's going to drop a link to that portfolio, the collection of projects in there as well. Um, Jason recently shared a blog on our journey of supporting these projects over the past 20 years. Um, and he talks about how the projects have helped to fill knowledge gaps, reduce barriers, and build relationships that can help link ecosystem level analysis with management decisions. Um, we'll drop the link in there as well if you'd like to learn a little bit more about the work that we've supported over the past 20 years around EBFM. Um, but of course, there is still much work to be done. And with the momentum behind these cover behind EBFM conversations and policies, like the recently updated EBFM roadmap from NOAA, um, there's a lot of opportunities to learn from successful case studies where EBFM has been tested and implemented in places around the world. Um, so we hope some of these projects and some of the results that you'll hear today uh, can help guide and advance conversations for moving these conversations forward. Um, this webinar is part of a two-part discussion or part one of a two-part discussion. Um, researchers today are sharing their results. And then on October 31st, we've invited them back along with a couple members from the South Atlantic and Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Councils. Uh, to discuss the feasibility of implementing a tool like portfolio theory in fisheries management. If you'd like to register for that um, and you're not already registered, Emily's also dropping a link to that webinar as well in the chat. Um, so before we get started, just a few logistical things I want to cover with everybody. Uh, to prevent any feedback or echoes, all attendees are muted, but we do want to hear from you. So please feel free to drop your comments or other resources you think would be useful to share with this group in the chat box during the webinar. Um, and if you have a question for the speakers, please submit that in the Q&A box. I'll be keeping track of those throughout the webinar and at the end, I'll read the questions out loud for the research team to answer. Uh, if we don't get to your question or if you have follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out to us at Lenfest or the research team directly after the webinar. We'd certainly love to hear from you. Um, and lastly, this webinar is being recorded, so we'll distribute the link broadly afterwards, and please feel free to share this with others and again, follow up with the research team with any questions. And with that, I'll stop talking and sharing my screen and turn it over to Jason to get us started for the presentation. Thank you, Kayla. Appreciate that. Appreciate the partnership with Linfest over the many decades and advancing uh, EBFM and related themes. Today, we want to talk to you about advancing EBFM and U U.S. fisheries, but really a very specific topic on portfolio theory and how we could potentially apply that. Uh, as Kayla mentioned, uh, Steve Cadron, Fiona Edwards, and Lauren Brewster are my colleagues working with me on this. You'll hear from some of them in a few moments, but let me set the stage for you. Fiona, I think if we could have the next slide, that'd be great. 
Um, what we're going to do is I'll talk to you about the theory and how it can help. Uh, Fiona is going to talk to you about some of the data decisions and what that might entail going into a multi-species portfolio. Lauren will then cover the actual economic analysis, and then we'll have the Q&A at the end. So just to give you a sense of where we're headed, what we're looking for, and what things might look like. So if we could go to the next slide to give you some context. This is our blue infographic of EBMness, if I'm allowed to say it like that. But fisheries management typically focuses at the bottom on the single species or populations level with with little consideration of the entire fishery system. And I want to be the first to say, hey, that's worked great. And there's a lot of positive outcomes from that. But at times it can be risky. And uh, the risks extend into the economic, social, and even governance considerations. And in many ways, portfolios and portfolio theory is tailor-made to explore that. So if we go to the next slide, oh, one back, thank you. If we move up to EBFM, the reality is, is that fishery managers are tasked with making a boatload of decisions, including harvest rates, target levels, spatial distributions of protections, et cetera. And to meet all those legal mandates, what we found is an ecosystem approach is not only allowable, but advisable. And this portfolio approach that we're going to talk to you about a little bit today might give you a sense of a method that could help us address some of those issues. And it might be a tool that we could use to help further EBFM. So if we could go to the next slide, a lot of you are wondering, what does portfolio theory have to do with fisheries? We'll try to make that connection for you. If nothing else, bottom line up front, uh, we do think there is an application of portfolios to fisheries. And if you think about your retirement fund, what's in your retirement fund? You don't have just one stock in your retirement fund that you're banking on, um, unless you're Warren Buffett and he has two or whatever, but he has a lot of those stocks. But the rest of us need to diversify. So anyways, portfolio comes from this Italian word. I'm not going to try to say it. I, I butcher even saying Italian cheeses. So that's the word that you have there, but it's really the sense of a collection of things. And then in a financial context, if you think about it from a financial market, it's all these different financial investments, stocks, bonds, commodities, cash, cash equivalents, and their counterparts in mutual funds, et cetera, et cetera, ETFs. All of that together makes up a portfolio for whatever objectives that you might have. And the key, key concept is diversification for any portfolio. And as you can see, a person's tolerance for risk and the investment objectives and the time horizon are all critical factors. So we have our financial advisor, uh, I believe Lauren, that's Fido. I can't remember Steve's dog's name. Anyways, that's our financial advisor and looking for whatever rate of return here. And you can see the graphic underneath that. There's what I'm showing you real quickly is a efficiency frontier or portfolio frontier. And based upon how comfortable and tolerant people are with risk, you can have 100% stocks, which probably would give you a high rate of return, but actually a lot of risk. And then all the way down to 100% bonds, which is fairly lower, relatively speaking, uh, return, but also a lot less risk. So maybe there's a mix of that that you want to explore. And again, the cartoon at the bottom kind of got cut off, but the whole point of all of these portfolios in a financial sense is you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. So that's what we're trying to think about and explore and apply to fisheries here today. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, in that context of a financial portfolio, there are emergent properties, and there's a whole host of theory and literature on this, that portfolio management units that are diverse are much more stable at the portfolio level than any given stock. And you can see um, some of the, the graphics there bounce around the individual stocks, but the aggregate is a lot more stable. Uh, portfolio approaches in theory have been explored for fisheries to mitigate risks, and you can see the types of risks we're talking about there in the parenthetical, there's actually a growing and robust literature on this. 
And I think this approach represents a systematic treatment of all the stocks or fisheries in a region or an ecosystem. And because of these emergent properties of portfolios and hierarchy theory and portfolio theory, you can focus on the aggregate dynamics of a group and actually potentially manage them as a management unit for a group of stocks. So we'll explore perhaps some of the implications of that. If we could go to the next slide. Uh, in essence, what you see, and, and Lauren in particular, Fiona probably as well will get to this but and repeat this, but this is a, an expected return on the left. And then what you can see on the bottom is the risk. And in essence, the theoretical studies show that the further away you are from an efficiency frontier, one of those two curves there, uh, the more risky you are and the less economic yield you get. So if you are on the solid blue line and that's a stock-based or single species-based portfolio, point B is further away. So the difference between point A and point B, and again, Lauren will get into this momentarily, that's the risk gap. And there's also a difference between an ecosystem-based or multi-species in, in direct consideration frontier compared to just the single species frontier, the dashed line and the solid line. And, and we will talk about that in a few moments. But the, the point being is that there is some pretty clearly worked out theories. There's some pretty obvious behaviors and we could take advantage of that fact. And in fact, I think we should. So if we go to the next slide, um, even though there's a lot of evidence for the value of this, there's very few applications in actual operational practice and consideration. And we understand uh, there's a lot of systems or systematic considerations. There's a lot of constraints, but we want to perhaps remove some of those concerns and just show you all, hey, this could potentially work. And here are some of the ways you want, might want to consider this and actually provide to you all at, at the end of the talk a tool or a set of tools that allow you to estimate this. So we actually worked on select regions of the U.S. There's also a national uh, overview, and we'll talk about that or show you that, that Howard Townsend led. And we actually had formal discussions with several uh, Fishery Management Council Science and Statistical Committees, and that was invaluable for us to get at the optimal ways we could explore some of these portfolios. So if I could have the next slide, I think I'm about ready to wrap it up. Yep. Um, we had a really excellent steering committee. I think on a project like this, you need to have an excellent steering committee. You need to have a good steering committee. You need to have an interdisciplinary steering committee. And you need to have people that have a mix of experiences, both scientifically, managerially, regulatory, uh, so forth. Um, Every person on here is fantastic. We enjoy working with them. That was uh, our top criteria. So they met that. And then the bottom row, I would argue we probably have 10% or one, one tenth, one fifth of uh, the world's, or at least the US's leading fisheries economists on our steering committee. So we, we've got some really great folks to help us. Uh, neither Lauren, Fiona, Steve or I are economists. So we were trying to do uh, an economic approach as applicable and approachable from, for non-economists. And hopefully you'll see we, we made a little progress towards that end. So with that, let me go to the next slide. Uh, the last thing I'll say is the one determinant of my success over my career is find uh, very capable, competent, excellent people, give them an idea, and then get out of their way. And what we've done is we've got Lauren and Fiona here. I don't know, Steve, I've known you too long to give you compliments about your capabilities, but uh, Lauren and Fiona are fantastic. They were the research team here out of uh, SMAS at UMass Dartmouth. And they really did walk through a lot, a lot, a lot of details and, and slug through how do you actually make this work? What does it look like? overcame a lot of hurdles. You'll hear about some of that here in a second, but I wanted to set the stage to summarize, tell you that economic portfolios are available. There's a lot of theory behind them. We think you can apply that theory 
to fisheries, and we think doing so helps advance some thinking towards ecosystem-based fisheries management. With that, I'm going to pass the baton over to you, Fiona. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction, Jason. So, hello, everyone. I'm going to introduce you all to our data source, as well as to examine, go over how we examine and prepare these data for frontier analyses, and finally, how we address data gaps when present. So, to begin, we're using publicly available commercial data obtained from the NIMS Landing database. Now, this data is freely available to access online from the link shown, and these data provide coverage across geography, taxonomy, fishing sector, and they provide reports on the value, amount, and other related information for landed species. In our explorations, we use the following parameters when downloading data sets from the database. We selected the commercial data set for all available years, with region type being NIMS regions. And then we select a region of interest, for example, New England, with all the data for all available species in that region being included. And then we run the report with totals by year, state, and species. And we run the report in this way because it allows for inclusion of landings information by state, which allows for further examination in the future if desired. Now, after downloading the raw data set, uh, it needs to be prepared in order to facilitate frontier analysis. And there are some aspects of the database that we need to consider. Um, first, I'd like to emphasize here that we're only working with commercial data and no recreational revenue or landings information is being included here. Um, second, there exists both public and confidential landings reports in the data set. Confidential landings are reports that are masked records and include less than three individual seafood sale transactions. Um, these reports provide no individual landing or revenue value for taxa, and due to this, they're removed. Uh, next, we're standardizing all revenue value, which is in dollars, to the dollar value of the most recent year in the data set. In most instances, this is 2022, but for some regions, for example, the Great Lakes region, um, this most recent year is 2018. And finally, as frontier analysis requires consecutive years of data, we then have to examine time series presence of species considered for the initial candidate portfolio. And at this stage, we can remove categories of non interest, for example, CVs. Now, um, this is an example of a candidate portfolio. A fisheries portfolio involves jointly managing fish stocks that have shared ecological, technical, market, and regulatory interactions. And one example here of the national candidate portfolio that could be investigated for a region would be those species managed by a local council. And shown here are the species managed by the New England Fisheries Management Council. And now, after identifying the potential candidate portfolio, there are several more steps that are required and must be taken in order to prepare this raw data for frontier analysis. So, continuing with the New England Council Managed Species example, uh, this figure shows the time series presence of taxa considered for the initial planet portfolio prior to any data decisions. Um, in a perfect world, we wouldn't have any data gaps, but as you can see, there are data gaps present for several taxa. And so frontier analysis requires a consecutive time series. So we have to address these data gaps when they are present. Now, when encountering data gaps, taxa must be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. And for these species, you can consider five actions. To aggregate them, to truncate the time series, to drop the species, or to add zeros, or to interpolate the missing years. Um, as you can see here, uh, four of these actions were taken for this candidate portfolio considered. Um, in our explorations overall, um, we've applied for these five actions to candidate portfolios. And we have not yet encountered an instance where interpolation was required. Um, and it should be emphasized that all these actions when making data decisions really benefit from local expert feedback. Um, now, uh, I know Jason has already brought it up, but for, we really have a wonderful steering committee, and I can't emphasize that enough. For this planet portfolio, when addressing data gaps, we first made initial data decisions and then revised them based on the suggestions of our steering committee members. And using their feedback and expertise, we were able to make data decisions tailored to this region. Uh, for example, here, um, for the council-managed state species, 
as all seven state species, which are highlighted here in yellow, um, are currently managed by the Northeast State Complex and are being managed together. Um, we aggregated them to limit the species specific information on, with the limited species specific information on states with the historical aggregation of states for more consecutive time series so that they could be included. Now, when I'm referring to a historical aggregation, I'm referring to mince names or the names given in the database to these taxa, um, which are denoted by two asterisks. And these taxa represent instances where species specific information was not present and they appear to be being phased out in favor of more species specific reports. Um, additionally, with this feedback, uh, we also were able to make decisions that allowed for the inclusion of ocean pout and Atlantic wolffish, which are highlighted here in blue. Um, these were no possession species towards the end of the time series, and using that information, we were able to include them in the portfolio analyses with zero as applied for those missing years of data for uh, landings and revenue in those years. Now, after making these late decisions, which we also had to drop several taxa as well as truncate the time series, we can see that we we're able to get a more consecutive time series, which facilitates frontier analysis. So shown here is the resulting time series presence of these species after data decisions were made. You can see highlighted in yellow that states have been aggregated together, and we now have a fully consecutive time series. Um, we also see that while we had some missing years for spiny barfish in the beginning, if we truncate the time series to 1980 and after, we're allowed to include it in our portfolio analyses. And finally, um, though as the other actions that we consider, we're not able to make up for missing years of data for several taxa, being um, Atlantic salmon, the deep sea crab, and offshore hick, we had to drop these species in order to facilitate generation of frontier and also of these efficiency frontiers. Now, by considering these five actions when facing tax with data gaps and applying these actions, it allows us to compensate for missing years of data and retain tax which otherwise would have had to be dropped and not included in our analyses. And it allows us to include these species, which otherwise would have to be dropped and all the correlations and information they have. And here I'm going to be passing it off to Lauren. Thanks, Fiona. Okay, so after we truncated the data, um, or the time series for the data, and worked out which species based on the data that was available to us that we could actually um, include, uh, Basically, I'm showing you here just a time series of uh, landings and then on the next slide revenue for the species that are in the portfolio that actually went went to creating the uh, economic frontiers. And really, all I want to point out here is that the uh, the magnitude and the composition of both the landings and the revenue changed over time. Obviously, it makes sense that the uh, revenue would change with the landings. So here, this is just um, the correlation matrix, matrix for the species that are in the portfolio. This particular correlation matrix is showing the revenue for the entire time series. And really, I just want to point out here that you can see that there's a lot of positive correlation as indicated um, by the color blue, particularly among the ground fish species. But as Jason mentioned, we really want to try and diversify um, across the assets within the portfolio. So in this case, diversifying across fish stocks um, and really trying to make as much as we can of negative correlations between stocks. So by introducing different species, such as um, the aggregated skate complex, sea scallops, uh, Atlantic herring and dogfish, we were able to add some negative correlation into our portfolio, particularly in relation to ground fish. And there are multiple drivers that are impacting this correlation matrix. So although we're showing revenue here, there are there are things underlying this, uh, which are driving these revenue trends. And these can be ecological, biological, economic, or as a result of management changes. Next slide, please. Thank you. 
Okay, so I'm going to spend some time on this slide and really try and walk you through um, what's going on with uh, a multi species um, efficient frontier. Um, because I'm sure to many people this looks quite alien. I know it definitely did to me uh, as somebody that wasn't coming from an economy background, uh, economist background when I started this work. So I'm going to talk you through what you're seeing with this efficient frontier on the left, and then also some jargon that you're gonna hear me repeating uh, throughout the rest of this seminar. So as Jason mentioned, uh, and as I just reiterated, in this context, a portfolio is a combination of assets, which is in this case, different fish stocks. And we're focusing specifically on species managed by the New England Fisheries Management Council Fisheries Management Plan. So Fiona just showed all of the data exploration that went into this. But we have applied this to uh, different management plans um, and taken various different strategies across different regions um, to look at look at the effect and uh, and the applications of um, portfolio theory in this context. So Jason mentioned earlier, we can look at uh, a portfolio via an efficient frontier. It's basically a graphical represent representation of different portfolios. Uh, where you're trying to attain a different uh, a different level of revenue and you're trying to minimize the risk that's associated with that target revenue. So on our um, graphical representation or our efficient frontier plot here on the left-hand side, you can see on the y-axis, you've got expected revenue or target revenue. Um, so those values are um, revenue targets that are defined by the user. And then on the x-axis, you've got risk to that revenue. And in this particular instance, we're measuring risk as the standard deviation of revenue. So here, typically in a financial context, you can think of um, risk as risk to your investment. So potentially losing some of your investment or taking increased risk um, with that. Ideally, basically, we're trying to take the smallest possible risk of failing to achieve our target revenue as we possibly can. A key assumption to this is that um, users are risk averse. You really want to try and maximize your revenue with taking as little risk as is possible. So, oh, yeah, thanks. Uh, so you've got two frontiers here. And I'm just going to pose that, this question to you um, just to think about. So assuming that people are risk averse, hopefully you're all risk averse with your retirement portfolios. If you're looking at this um, sort of peach colored frontier and this blue frontier, if you're wanting to maximize your return on your investment and minimize risk, which do you think would be the most appropriate frontier to choose? And hopefully most of you are picking the red one. Um, and basically that in this context is representing our multi-species or what we're going to term as our EBFM portfolio, whereas the blue line is representing our single species frontier. You can think of each of these dots. Uh, sorry, next slide, Fiona. Thanks. Uh, you can think of each slide uh, each uh, dot on each of these frontiers as a changing composition of your portfolio. So that's essentially what's going on underneath the hood. Uh, you may choose to take a more conservative approach. So you're uh, trying to achieve uh, less revenue. Um, and that might be because you want to take less risk. And so, for example, if you were thinking about it from a financial context, you might have a higher composition of bonds than you do of stocks. Um, on the far end, if you have a more aggress aggressive investment strategy uh, where you're wanting to achieve a higher expected revenue, your composition of your portfolio might change. So again, thinking of your stocks and bonds in terms of uh, fish stocks, your composition of your, um, your portfolio is changing depending on what you want your target revenue to be. And that composition is going to change in order to minimize risk. Next slide, please, Fiona. Okay, so basically, oh, go back one. Thank you. So basically, um, what we're trying to do is uh, 
look at a distribution of these target revenues, um, calculate the risk associated with them, and create basically draw a line between these uh, these different target revenues to create our frontier. You can see as well uh, a point here indicated by a black dot, um, which is labeled B. That's realized revenue, or you might hear me use the term interchangeably observed revenue. And that by that, I'm just referring to revenue that was actually achieved in any given year. The equivalent point, so A on the blue line, um, is showing how much risk could have been assumed for the same level of revenue that was actually achieved, so the same target revenue as to the realized revenue on the single species curve. And then A prime is showing the risk associated with the target revenue had we operated on an ecosystem um, based fisheries management frontier. And you can see uh, a number of uh, lines, RG3, RG2, and RG1, those are delineating different types of risk gaps. And the risk gap is basically just the difference between two given values. Uh, typically between, uh, we typically think of it as the difference between our realized revenue, so point B, and A prime, so the equivalent revenue on our uh, ecosystem-based fisheries management frontier. Okay, next slide, please, Fiona. So I'm not going to get into, I'm going to try not to get into the weeds in terms of how we do this, but just to give you sort of an overall um, workflow. To start with, we look at our data and we determine our target revenues. So basically work out where we want to put these dots uh, to create our frontiers. And in this particular case, we've set the code up so that it's um, just looking at a distribution of the historical revenue uh, over the course of the time series. So in this case, from 1980 through to 2021. Then we're trying to work out um, the optimal weights. So basically the weights are, try are defining the um, composition of our portfolio. So again, think of each of those target revenue dots as a changing pie chart. Um, the composition of your stocks are changing. Um, and basically we're trying to find the ideal weight or slice of that pie chart that each stock should be allocated to. And when we talk about financial portfolio theory and implementing it to a fisheries context, this is not a one-to-one -one analogy. There obviously are some fundamental differences. First of all, um, and probably most importantly, we have to think about some uh, biological constraints. These are an important parameter. Our fish stocks, unfortunately, are not exhaustible. And we do need to cap how much um, a species can contribute towards that portfolio composition. So we can adjust certain parameters within the code. And one of the most important ones is selecting a biological constraint. And that's essentially just putting a cap on this optimal weight for any given species. Then we're putting this whole process through or we're using quadratic optimization to try and minimize the uh, risk for each species and find that ideal revenue weight for a given species. Um, and we're doing all of this, obviously, for two different frontiers. The difference fundamentally here is when we're creating these frontiers and we're running the quadratic optimization, uh, if you think back to that correlation matrix of revenue, for single species um, in that covariance matrix, we're only considering the diagonal. So we're only considering the variance between a species uh, within a stock. Um, so this is analogous to single species management. Whereas when we're running this code, we're uh, and we're trying to create the um, trying to pull the revenue weights for our red um, EBFM frontier we're considering the entire covariance, so the diagonal and the off-diagonal. Another key parameter that you can change is uh, the decay factor. That basically just allows us to downweight older data in the time series if you want to. So really just laying more emphasis on um, more uh, recent uh, conditions, basically. From there, we can go on, calculate the realized revenue risk, so that point B and then ultimately work out the difference between the uh, the risk between 
A prime, so the optimized revenue and point B. So I'm gonna focus on RG2, risk gap two, which as I mentioned is the difference between A prime and B. Next slide, please Fiona. Okay, so there's a various different ways to visualize Lauren, this. Lauren, if I could actually interrupt you for a second. Yeah. Sorry, um, someone asked a question in the Q&A and I know I said that I was gonna ask at the end, but I think it actually would be really good to ask it right now since you're going over the slide. Um, can you go back one more slide? Uh, this person was asking, why is expected revenue the appropriate measure of return? Um, in other words, what happens with those costs? Um, yeah, so I thought this it would be like good to explain it here. And I just want to thank you for walking us through all of this because it's very helpful. Yeah, no problem. Um, so in this particular instance, we used revenue because that's what's available within the publicly available um, data set. But the, the metric that you can use to determine value basically within this um, portfolio context could be changed. Um, it really depends on the data set that you're working with. Uh, this is really just sort of a, it's a simple way of capturing the efficiency of the frontier. But yes, you, you could consider costs as well. There are various things um, that could become important. For example, if you're uh, like, this doesn't account for recreational fisheries and how you would quantify uh, revenue for recreational fisheries. So this is just one example metric that you could use. Um, that was the, the most applicable with the data set that we have access to. Does that help? That's great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. Um, so there are a number of ways or a couple of primary ways that we can uh, display all of these results. So this dynamic plot is uh, based on a previous publication by Jin and his collaborators that was published in 2008. Uh, and I think uh, Emily already dropped the link for that. So this is our preferred way of showing the frontier analysis. The, it's a little bit hard to digest uh, when you initially look at it. Uh, but basically, the reason we prefer it is because it's showing how the frontier can change from the beginning of the time series and as you add an additional year. Uh, and you can see that's changing over time. Uh, this, it's also easier to uh, incorporate a decay factor this way if you want to do that. Uh, and I'm not going to get into the details of that uh, in this seminar, but I can direct you to um, some literature that we published and has been published previously to, to try and explain that in greater detail. Um, but also it allows the constraints to change over time. So the conditions that we see in 2021 might, might not and probably don't reflect the conditions that are seen earlier in the time series. So for example, that biological constraint that I mentioned earlier, which is really important for um, working out a realistic composition uh, of the portfolio can change over time. Okay, next slide, please. So I'm just gonna highlight uh, one year in the time series using this dynamic plot, which uh, where the parameters are changing over time or the biological constraints specifically is changing over time. So I'm gonna highlight 2006, just because you can see that our realized revenue is way off to the right hand side. So a fair amount of risk was taken in 2006 to obtain, obtain that high level of revenue. Next slide, please Fiona. So this is just 2006 uh, blown up so it's easier for you to see. Um, but basically by working with people that are really familiar with the fisheries in the region, uh, we think that the this particular risk gap is so large because there was a change in the perception of the stock size for herring and that impacted the price as well as the demand for, um, for herring bait. So really, I just wanted to point out 2006 to say that there are various different reasons why um, your risk gap, actually next slide, please, Fiona. Oh, next one. I'm going to get you to the back. So there are various different reasons why a risk gap um, might change over time and being able to consult with uh, experts in the region and who are re really familiar with the fishery can help us to can help us understand some of these patterns that we might be seeing that might be driven by a particular species 
or changes in uh, fishing behavior or even management. Uh, could you go back one slide, please, Fiona? Thanks. Okay. Uh, and another way of visualizing these results and perhaps uh, an easier way of visualizing these results is through this static plot, which was first introduced by Sancho Rico um, in 2008. Um, sorry, I think that I had the year wrong previously on the GIN paper. Um, but basically this is just showing that terminal frontier, the terminal year frontier, so 2021, against the realized revenues for each of the years in the time series. So it's a little bit easier to digest uh, rather than the multi-panel plot, um, but it's not necessarily comparing apples to apples um, for details that I won't get into on this particular slide, but I'm happy to answer questions about it at the end if you like. Um, one way that you can potentially get around the apples to apples uh, scenarios is potentially breaking down the plots into shorter time series so that your realized revenue conditions in any given year are more directly applicable or relatable to the frontier that you're the terminal year frontier. Okay, next one. I'll go back to the risk one. Sorry, Fiona. Okay, so. Just, I mentioned the risk gap earlier, but again, just to highlight that this is the difference uh, in risk between uh, point B, so your realized revenue and the equivalent target revenue on the EBFM frontier. So it's, you can see the schematic up in the top right, this is RG2. Uh, and I want to point out that, for example, in 2021, so the last year in the time series, there's about half a million dollars worth of risk that was taken that didn't necessarily have to be taken had we been implementing this EBFM portfolio approach. Okay, next slide. And this uh, slide's really just trying to show you what's happening underneath the hood of these frontiers. So as I've mentioned multiple times, your composition of your portfolio to try and minimize the risk for each target revenue is changing. So here you can see gray bars, which are showing you, this is over, sorry, on the X axis, you've got the last, I think 11 years of the time series. And obviously you can see each of these species, uh, it's broken down by species, every species in the portfolio. And the gray bars that you can see here are basically indicating the revenue weight. Um, so basically, how much or what proportion of um, catch went to each species within our portfolio. So that's what actually was done. Um, and then I've been talking about this a, a lot in terms of looking at past performance of using these frontiers to look at past performance of um, the fisheries. But if we want to implement this moving forward, we need to really know the optimal revenue weight. So what should we what should our ideal portfolio composition look like? And those are indicated by the blue bars. So you can directly compare here with, for each species in any given year, what was actually fished or harvested to what level and then what ideally we should have been harvesting to obtain the same level of target revenue that was achieved in that year, but minimizing risk. So, for example, you can see that there was um, more of an over-reliance, for example, on sea scallops in the bottom left-hand corner, um, Atlantic herring in the uh, second to bottom row, spiny dogfish, sorry, I should have a pointer to be able to, I'm sort of dotting around, but, um, whereas ideally um, under the hood, our analysis is saying, we perhaps could have, um, you know, fished skates harder than we were actually fishing them. Uh, we could have uh, harvested red hake um, more than we actually were. So there are things. There are obviously plenty of things to consider here. There's sort of like the ideal, um, you know, looking at this from a, a a high level, but you need to break it down. You need to think about the practicalities of this. So I'm going to point out, for example, Atlantic wolf fish, um, and I've 
deliberately left this in to show you that um, even though because of the way that the constraints are set up currently in this model, um, you wouldn't actually be able to fish Atlantic wolf fish in 2013 at its maximum historical weight from the beginning of the time series because it became a zero possession species in 2010. So when you start to dig into it, there are things that you need to look for um, and you need to tweak as you as you go along. So maybe maximum historical weight over the course of the entire time series may not be realistically practical to implement. And you might want to change some of those biological constraints to um, be, for example, maximum sustainable yield for that species in any given year. This, I think, also highlights that, um, you know, we have Atlantic wolf fish in the portfolio. We have window pane and ocean pout in the portfolio, but there's no indication here that they're, that we need to be fishing them that much harder to be able to get to our uh, revenue whilst minimizing risk. So if Fiona, if you can go to the next slide. Using that and also using a plot like this, we can start to dig into what the effect is of each species on our portfolio composition, which what's really driving um, each portfolio. So here you can just see a black dotted line. Again, this is our terminal year frontier. Um, the black dotted line is representing what you saw earlier um, in the both the, the terminal year of the dynamic plot and in the static plot. But we're then iteratively removing each species. So you can see what the impact is of that species on the frontier. And you can see that by removing either scallops or haddock in particular, uh, you're not going to achieve the same level of revenue uh, as you would if you implemented the, well, for scallops in particular, you're not going to achieve the same level of revenue as if using the full portfolio. But moreover, to obtain any given level of revenue, you have much, you're incurring more risk. Okay, next slide, please. So just to try and wrap this up, um, basically, we can use frontier analysis to uh, evaluate economic benefits of coordinated multi-species management. With more coordinated management, we can do two things. We can either um, reduce the risk for any given level of revenue, or we can increase our returns for uh, the same level of risk that's being taken. So ultimately coordinated management from all of the portfolio compositions that we've looked at, combinations that we've looked at in the various different regions seems to have economic benefits. Um, and I'm gonna uh, sort of direct you towards Howard Townsend's paper, which uh, the link's just been dropped to, but the, you, there's a QR code and the, the circular QR, QR code will take you to that paper and that demonstrates that really nicely. So this is just a first pass and getting sort of going back to Kayla's um, question. This is a first pass with pu publicly available data. So you could potentially change the metrics. It doesn't have to necessarily be, be revenue related to the landings. It could be some other metric for value on your y-axis. But this is, it's easy for people to access. It's easy for people to start running code now that we've made it publicly available. Um, and it's a good starting point, especially if you might need more information to get around firewalls and things like that. Is this worth investigating further before starting to um, get into sort of data agreements and things like that? This really demonstrates that there's a lot of benefit from being able to flexibly, flexibly harvest and move between different species and allow that to change um, over time. Next slide, please, Fiona. We found collaboration with regional experts has been imperative at various different stages. First, to do um, with any of our decisions, really, as Fiona mentioned, um, relating to data um, decisions that we made um, and tweaking model parameters. There are trade offs in data decisions um, in terms of. The, the economic ramifications of the time series that you're looking at and the species that you're looking at. And ideally you want to try and represent current conditions if you're using this to um, move forward for implementing ecosystem-based fisheries management. This is a complement to single species stock assessment. So we can't estimate a resource or a fishery status using this method. 
Um, so we can use it primarily to address trade-offs of uh, single species versus uh, EBFM. And ultimately, we really wanted to bring this conversation and this method back into um, the current day forum. We want to make it more accessible to fisheries management. So as Jason alluded to, we're definitely not economists. Uh, we ha have natural science backgrounds. Um, so it was a lot for us to get our heads around uh, to start with, but hopefully we can present this in a way that's more digestible um, and make it more accessible uh, to a broader audience. And then finally, um, a major part of us being able to do that and facilitate its potential uptake is by making the code publicly available so that people can start working with it, give us feedback on it. This code is always evolving, always being cleaned up. Um, we're constantly tweaking things uh, and it's available on GitHub. So there's a QR code um, in the square box so that you can take a look at that. Um, and yeah, next slide, please. So with that, I'm going to wrap things up. I really want to thank Lenfest for the funding that got this project off the ground. Um, it's We really benefited from a diverse steering committee and the funding pro provided by Lenfest allowed us to get a lot of really valuable feedback and get these um, conversations going with uh, region, regional management councils. Uh, I also want to thank the Walton Family Foundation um, who continued some funding for us so that we could take this uh, from, look at this on a wider regional basis within the US and some further funding from SINA. Uh, again, thank you very much to our wonderful steering committee that we hope we will continue working with as we develop this. And then also to the late Steve Edwards who um, developed the concept and the initial methods. And with that, I'll just go to the last slide and say, as Kayla mentioned, there's uh, another uh, part, or there's a part two of this at the end of October, uh, where we'll be discussing trying to actually implement this for into fisheries. And I'm gonna leave it there. Perfect, that's great. Thanks, thanks again for the plug for the part two of this discussion, which I think will be um, really interesting to hear. It's going to be very focused on like more of a panel discussion style as opposed to presentations. Um, so we hope all of you can come back and join us for that and be a part of that discussion. Um, and I'd really like to thank you, uh, Lauren, for walking us through all of the economic analysis around this. Um, I know like from my perspective, it's a little hard to understand, but I really love the way you walked us through all of that. Um, and thank you, Jason, for setting us up and Fiona for helping us learn a little bit more about the data that was used in this project. Um, you can go ahead and stop sharing your screen, Fiona, if you'd like, so that we can see everybody. Um, and I welcome both Jason and Steve to join us as well um, for the Q&A. Uh, we do have a few in the chat, um, so I'll just go ahead and get started with that um, since we have about seven minutes left. Um, so the first question I think was sort of answered, uh, Lauren, in the last slide that you were going through, um, but councils are mandated to prevent overfishing for each stock. And so this person would just like to confirm that things like changes in stock assessment or stock status assessments, et cetera, can be incorporated as part of one of those biological parameters to inform the frontier analysis. Do you want me to take that or someone else want to take it? <laughs> We're all nodding our heads to say Jason. fundamentally, most important thing is, yes, yeah. you can. <laughs> but if someone wants to take more detail, they can. Yeah, I'll, t I'll jump in there. I say, so in general, if we allow flexibility to fishermen to move off of depleted stocks and move on to healthy stocks, um, that in itself would tend to avoid overfishing. But the concern is valid, is that uh, we can't rely on that flexibility itself and so these portfolio analyses, from my perspective, uh, really would benefit from supplementary analyses that have population dynamics. Um, in fact, part of our team, uh, Max Greslick with the NOAA Fellowship, is doing exactly that with Fiona's uh, portfolio, a multi-species operating model managed as a portfolio, and does that decrease the frequency of overfishing uh, or depleting stocks. So the concern is valid. This will partly avoid overfishing, but in my mind, not entirely. Jason, how would you answer that? 
everything you all said, I totally agree with you can incorporate this. The one thing I would clarify is the councils are not mandated to prevent overfishing on every stock. They're mandated to prevent overfishing on the fishery. And in the Magnuson, there's an MSY element. You can go to the national standards and we get this a lot. Hey, this is great, but you can't do this because it's multiple species or aggregate species. And in fact, you can. So I just wanted to clarify that part of the question. Thank you. Great. Um, is it possible to incorporate constraints about what permits are held for different species, either by an individual or in an aggregate? Uh, just thinking that management choices very much determine what people are able to harvest. I'll go first on this one. Is that permit flexibility is one of these things that would allow fishermen to target um, different stocks. And so uh, permit packaging or maybe uh, permit splitting to allow fishermen to sell their permits to, to multiple buyers. Um, any way that we can... Um, allow fishermen to move off depleted stocks and move on healthy stocks would help. And permitting is one of them. Access is one of them. Um, and so if there are considerations in any of the councils towards permit splitting or uh, endorsements, this tool can help with the cost benefit analysis of what would be the economic benefits of doing that. And um, that's why working with the councils on how they permit uh, different resources, different target species is part of going from single species towards an EBFM portfolio. Great, thank you. Um, we're actually getting quite a few questions in the chat and they're all really great. Um, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be able to get to all of them today, but I'm going to try as much as possible and um, whatever we don't get to, we can follow up with everybody, but we also could use this as a starting point for our discussion um, in the next webinar. Um, okay, so next question. Are revenues adjusted for inflation over a time series to be comparable? Yes, they are. So um, we're, we're adjusting for inflation to real world dollars in the terminal year of the time series. So in this particular example, everything was um, converted or adjusted to 2021. Great. Um, can you explain how you estimate the biological reaction to different portfolios? Start, and I, th I think I'm building off my last answer, is that this uh, frontier analysis is an economic analysis of retrospective data series. It does not include population responses. And that's why I think having a supplemental population dynamics um, simulation management strategy evaluation is needed to do that, to evaluate the responses of populations to these removals. Uh, in itself, this frontier analysis cannot do that, but uh, I'm open to other people on the team answering as well. The one other thing I would add is the biological response or ecological response is tracked in the EBFM versus the single species element via some of the correlation. So you can look at some of that. And certainly these time series of revenues are real or biomasses either way are realized representations of how the biology responds. So you know, Steve is right. You can't get into the specifics of any given dynamic for a particular stock, but I think you can infer some of those responses based upon how the portfolio has played out over time. Great. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, can you give an example of how this could be applied in the real world fisheries management and what management implications could be derived from the revenue risk plot? Jump in again, but uh, ask other people to supplement. Um, what I think is that if there are alternative strategies being considered um, in one extreme, a single permit for a single target species, and another extreme, you would have a, a demersal complex or a fish that are, are caught together. 
Um, and you could evaluate, you could use the, the frontier analysis to evaluate the relative benefits and risks of those two. And there's a lot of uh, strategies that are in the middle as well that allow some flexibility um, without being a single basket, uh, multi-species basket TAC. But uh, those two extremes could definitely be evaluated using this method. Lauren, Fiona, you want to add? No, I don't have anything to add at the moment. The one thing I would augment, if Fiona, you don't have anything, I thought I saw you shake your head. Oh, no, I, I think Dr. Kidden sums it up in there really well. <laughs> The one thing I would add is this is a metric of almost fisheries performance. You can measure how well you're doing, maybe not necessarily like a harvest control rule in ACL or something like that, but in a, a post hoc evaluation, hey, how we do, what can we do, where could we improve, what could we maybe tweak? So I think that's a very tangible real world application that we would potentially propose people look at as an outcome of some of these types of analyses. I think that's an excellent response. In fact, the plot that uh, Lauren showed from New England and the different decadal periods um, show that before we ended overfishing and rebuilt stocks, there was a lot of flexibility for fishermen to target, and that performed relatively well. Uh, when we went to ending overfishing and rebuilding stocks, uh, there were many choke stocks that made the catch and variance uh, less efficient. And then recently, the annual catch limits have increased those constraints. And so we've been going further and further from this multi-species optimum with our management strategy. So as Jason said, if we're looking at a retrospective evaluation of what's worked or what have been the features of different management strategies, this tool can do that too. Good to know. All right. Well, we are just over a a minute over. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and end the webinar. Thank you all so much for being here today, um, both attendees and also to our speakers. It was a great presentation. Uh, thank you all for your questions. Um, we will try to follow up with you. And if not, please come to the second webinar that we have on October 31st, and we'll hope to get to your questions then as well. Um, but yeah, everyone have a great day and thanks for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kayla.